actually will be interviewing as a team. You are the best movers on the planet. So bro, what kind of muscles you have? No. Bro, what kind of patterns you have? We're here to fuck shit up. Bro, what are your, uh, what, shit, what, what is it in the intro? It's not what kind of muscles, patterns you have. Bro, what kind of patterns do you have? That's what it is. Movement Athlete uh, yeah. Podcast, episode. People, a few people have said they love it. Love it. Oh, did I just fuck that up? Sorry. I, I don't, that's how authentic this is. We're just, we're rolling. Okay. We, we don't have any plan or anything. <laughs> one, one, two, three, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Movement Athlete Podcast, episode, what is this, six? Should be six, yeah. Six, hell Mail yeah. Ba- mailbag number two. Part two. I'm Dr. Wes Hendricks. I'm John Lindsay. All right, John. Let's let's just get right into the questions here. We're just going to keep it rolling from last time. Okay. Yeah. So the first one we've got is best stretches for tight hamstrings. All right. What what do you like? So for me, I mean, very simple two movements that I think work really well are single leg good mornings paired with hip flexion lifts. So Oh, wow. um, the single leg good morning is essentially it could be double leg into sort of a uh, move that kind of takes place we are uh, standing ideally with straight knees driving the hips back and fighting to keep an anterior tilt in the low back until we just get a really gnarly stretch in the hamstrings we press the feet into the ground and we come back up and we just repeat reps of that um, and then the hip flexion raise is just standing ideally back against the wall. So you're not going to be able to compensate and lean backwards. And you're just lifting one leg at a time straight up in front of you, pausing for about five seconds. Uh, but during the pause, you're trying to lift higher and higher. Um, maybe five reps of that paired with 10 reps of the single leg good mornings. I find that to be super effective. So why would you, so since it was a hamstring stretch, why would you include, it, include a hip flexion movement? So when you're going into anything that's stretching the hamstrings, you're shortening the hip flexors. And a lot of times people are so weak when their hip flexors are in a shortened position. And so that drill is just an easy way to, you'll feel it. If your hamstrings are tight, you'll probably be like, holy shit, I can't lift my leg very high. And, or you'll just start cramping like crazy in the hip flexor. So you get the hip flexor strong in a shortened range. It's going to expediate the uh, hamstring mobility gains pretty quickly. So I would have 100% gone with the one-legged good mornings as well. Um, yeah. So so nothing authentic or interesting to add here. The only thing I'd say is um, I always like to start with one-legged good mornings versus something like a Jefferson curl because I want people stretch just from my perspective, especially a lot um, in the clinic when I'd have lower back pain patients. You know, a lot of people come in with flexion intolerant uh, lower back pain, so they flexion would or bending forward would hurt it. So how do we stretch the hamstrings if we need to stretch the hamstrings if we can't bend forward and touch our toes? Um, so the one-legged good morning is a great option for it. Um, so you can work on that posterior chain mobility without aggravating something that can be pissed off with lower back flexion. I'm not saying flexion is a bad thing, but I think it's good to stretch the hamstrings without compensating uh, in your spine to start. Later down the road, Jefferson curls are great when you're ready for it, but I always like to start and then progress to Jefferson curls. Yeah, I love Jefferson curls. I mean, I they go in and out of my programs all the time. But I feel like someone who is super stiff, and I know when I was super stiff, if some, someone showed me a Jefferson curl, I'd be like, oh, my God, that's going to destroy me. Like, <laughs> doubt. like there'd be a fear factor there for sure. So the single leg good morning appear is much more safer too. So. And do you have both of those uh, movements you just talked about on your Instagram page? Uh, absolutely, somewhere on there. Most likely on the YouTube channel as well. I'm, I'm okay. sure you do too. All right, perfect. All right, let's hop over to the next one. And that's a good segue. So if someone's having a disc problem, um, is not go- this is really written, written poorly, is not going after having much therapy sessions, what should, okay, so they're disc getting tre- problem, the yeah. pain is not going away mm-hmm. after, after some therapy sessions, what should I do? Yeah, there we go. The, I'm reading this and I'm just like, all right, now, now that we figured out what's going on there. Um, so, so that's a tough one right off the bat, because first of all, I don't know if it's an upper disc, um, issue or a lower disc issue. So the, the types of intervention or how we're going to address it are going to be totally different, um, based upon whether it's a higher lumbar and I'm assuming, and we didn't even say lumbar disc. I'm just assuming lumbar disc. Um, it could very well be a cervical disc issue. Um, but I'm just going to assume 
lumbar disc here. So um, now, now as I've read it, I'm like, shit, we should have probably omitted this one because it was so poorly worded and they gave us next to no information. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, I, really, I, <laughs> I mean, we get the general, like my back hurts. What should I do? That's essentially what I think this question is saying. This really is. There, there's um, not much more after that. Um, so general rule of thumb there. Um, well, first of all, find a better therapist if you're not getting better. Um, that'd be the simple answer, but you know, um, avoid things that piss it off. Think about it like a cut or scab. You continue to pick at it. It's not going to heal. The recommendation I like to make to my clients um, don't pass about a three out of pen on three out of ten on the pain scale. Um, for some of my clients that are just major pussies, I'll tell them a four or a five because they're super dramatic. Um, but most of the time, you know, I tell people if it's a three out of ten on the pain scale, you're probably not doing damage. You're going to make it worse. Um, I always like to tell people also, unless you're in like a full body cast, you probably want to think about doing some sort of training. It's just a matter of don't piss it off. So that rule, that three out of the ten rule, is a good rule to go by. Um, yeah, because we don't have much more information. That's about as good as I can give you. Um, I'm giving you kind of a generic blanket statement answer because I got a blanket question. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say, given the question is I would be curious how well do you move, well do you move and how strong are your legs? I mean, I think just doing some general hip mobility, easy stuff like hip yeah. cars, maybe some really slow squats, slow lunges like that. That could yep. go a long way. I mean, a lot of people lack hip mobility and lower body strength, and those two things can help out a low yeah, back quite a bit. So. Absolutely. If it's not making it worse, you know, um, during, the, during the activity or especially the next day, that's how you can kind of gauge your capacity for movement, and then you can slowly progress it over time. And I think we talked about this last time, you know, just slowly increasing your capacity. Um, so, yeah, I wish there – you know, when I saw disc in the first sentence, I was like, ooh, this can be a good one. And then as I tackled it, I was like, we now we now know silently read the question. You <laughs> read the whole question. Didn't read aloud. <laughs> Lesson learned. We're still learning here. So. <laughs> All right. Do, do you want to tackle the next one here? Yeah, I already read it in my head. Okay, so good. You read it in your brain, head. Brain, yeah. <laughs> how do you, how do you balance mobility work, cardio training, and strength training in your routine? Um, so I'll go first. Uh, yeah. I don't do much structured cardio. I think we touched on that in the previous mailbag, but. As far as the strength training and mobility work goes, mine are separate sessions. I, I think we touched on this too, so I'll be quick here. Mine are separate sessions, and I just I, I know what my week's going to look like the week going into it, and I just schedule it around. It's usually the strength sessions are always in the morning, and I know I'm going to get those in on the same day because um, I'm always going to wake up early and do it. But the mobility work, I kind of look at my schedule because those are going to take me anywhere from 45 minutes to maybe an hour, and I just look, okay – where can I piece these four things into my schedule at? Um, pretty simple, but that, that's it. I just look at my schedule and get it in when I know I'm going to be able to give my best efforts. So. All right. So my, mine's a little different because um, my cardio right now is jujitsu. Um, so there, there's a little bit of um, an intuitive approach to my training because um, for the people that do jujitsu, you know, you're going to go to class and some, some days, you know, you get a bunch of easy rolls, you feel fine the next day. Um, other times for me, I feel like I've been run over by a bus, depending on who I've rolled with the previous night. Um, so, you know, if, if I have a hard session, maybe I won't lift the next day and I'll wait a day. Um, so a lot of the times a seven day training week for me is going to turn into an eight or nine, nine day week training week. And that's totally fine because I'm just kind of listening to my body to a certain extent. Um, so I can perform, um, and I don't do too much too soon. Um, which kind of goes back to the whole thing of causing injury or um, what we talked about last time or exceeding your capacity. So I, I, I definitely take an intuitive approach, which is hard for a lot of people as well, because, you know, if you, people like to go off the work week and most people work on a, a normal seven day week, you know, every day is Monday, every day is Friday for me. So like I, I have a little more flexibility in that regard. Um, but in terms of, general strength. I actually only strength train four days a week. Now I, I've backed it off to accommodate that jujitsu as well. So that's how I'm balancing the two right now. Um, mobility is still taking a, um, a back seat. So I do it kind of secondary, like we talked about in the last podcast. Cool. Um, all right. On to the next one. So mm -hmm. can lifting weights alone cause major flexibility gains for the average lifter? 
and then in parentheses exercise selection so maybe some examples of some good bang yeah. for your buck uh weightlifting drills that could improve some flexibility okay um so i guess first off it would depend on your major what does major yeah. flexibility gains means what are you you're not going to sumo deadlift your way into a middle split um you're probably not going to split squat your way into a front split um but there's definitely a lot of things you can do i know west definitely caters more of his lifting session tailored kind of that way where he's working through a full range of motion and getting some mobility work out of it um and you can definitely do things like uh split squats full range of push-ups on the rings where you're really taking your shoulder through a massive range of motion stuff like that um and and get some big gains uh so yeah you can definitely make some good progress th through weightlifting yeah and i think we touched on this one too it might have been when we talked about um programming one of the episodes i feel like we've talked about this that you know at a certain point your definition of major flexibility gains like you already talked about um you have to get more specific. So no, you're not going to, I'm just repeating what you said. Now you're not going to get a middle split from sumo deadlifting. I really like that comparison. Actually, that was clever. It just came to me. It's <laughs> really smart actually, <laughs> but yeah, you know, but you can by all means make good flexibility gains, you know, above average, um, exercise selection. Uh, you already covered that too. Let's just go on. Yeah. I'm just going to repeat what you said. You crushed that. Um, Let's go to the handstand one. Handstands, consistency versus the line for beginners. Handstand is a little bit plunge, big issue at first. Question. That's a question. <laughs> That's a question. Um, so, so what do you what do you think? I know you get asked this a lot. It seems yeah, this like, is this um, a, a good you one. You preach about it a lot too. It seems um, like too. And that was de this has been kind of um, passed on to me, and I learned this from Nelson. How do we say his last name? Curran. I don't know. We're I didn't say that you. very confidently. No, that was like, was that a question or a statement? It, it Nelson, was a question mark Nelson that, yeah. something. We'll tag him on this. I don't even know if he's on Instagram that much lately. Um, he's my go-to reference for handstand um, questions I have, and we're actually hoping to get him on the podcast. So I got this from him, and it, it makes total sense. Um, and I've kind of molded it to just kind of my own standards here. So for the most part, if somebody doesn't have a – consistent 30 second handstand. So when we're saying consistent, um, if you kick up 10 times, eight out of those 10 times, you're going to hit a 30 second handstand. Um, don't even worry about the line. It doesn't matter how banana it is, how planched it is. If you don't have enough, um, balance coordination, um, awareness to be up, up, upside down for that long, don't even worrying about, you know, pushing away from the floor, adjusting your rib cage, trying to get a neutral spine position, trying to get everything stacked into place um, because your, your balance isn't established yet. So more energy is going towards the balance and you're just, you're wasting extra energy that could be focused on the balance to, to clean up the line. So, you know, if, if you're not at that 80% for 30 seconds, 20, 20, 30 seconds, I wouldn't worry about um, the line at this point in time. It's, it's not a major issue. You know, you're not going to hurt your wrist, hurt your shoulders, you know, your spine isn't going to explode if it's a crooked handstand. Um, it's just visually, you're not as going to get as many likes on Instagram. That's about the only issue you're going to have. <laughs> just find the right camera angle and you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll if you want good. to, I mean, at the end of your session or maybe before you, probably at the end of your session, hop back on the wall and just work on some line reinforcement mm -hmm. there. Like that stuff definitely helped me out a lot in the beginning. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think I... One thing my uh, my wife struggles with, is she has a pretty good line, but she'll kick up and she'll let herself walk her hands like once or twice. And she'll never like, and she always does that. And th this will be the test if she listens to this podcast or not. She'll say <laughs> um, Called out. And she'll let herself walk like once or twice with the hands and kind of set it. And she's never, and I keep telling her, you're never developing like the full awareness in the hands in the elbows in the shoulders because you let yourself move so don't let yourself get away with that if you're a if you're someone who does that definitely reinforce if you're going to have to walk the hands come down yeah i feel like that's a lot of wasted energy i was never able to walk to save it all right best exercise for internal rotation of the shoulder without equipments equipments or singular so no equipment, equipment. No, equi no equipment whatsoever <laughs> No equipment. What have you got? Um, so, I mean, the only one I can really think of off the top of my head is uh, like the classic sleeper stretch where you're sideline 
um mm -hmm. you're kind of in like a a, a spooning position like a you spooning. and i are spooning yeah i was gonna say fetal but yeah spooning <laughs> um and then your arm that's arm that's on the floor comes up and you essentially take your other hand and you slowly force your shoulder into internal rotation um from there if you're familiar with functional range conditioning you could work some pails and rails um an easy one you could do that's not as complicated as pails and rails is a passive range hold where you're pushing your shoulder into as much passive range as you have and then slowly letting go and just trying to maintain that position. Um, I like that one. That's, that's probably the best one I can think of. So if we did have equipments or equipment, I'd recommend uh, dumbbell Cuban rotations. But honestly, you could program it at a rep scheme and a tempo that you could grab – you know, I'm looking around my kitchen. All I'm seeing is bananas. You'd have really weak internal rotators if bananas were tough on you. You know, but find a, a water bottle or something that weighs a couple pounds, and you could easily train um, those dumbbell Cuban rotations. Yeah, John's using a hydro flask right now. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at a very, very slow tempo, you know, four seconds down, two seconds back up for 12 reps. Um, that weight of that hydro flask is going to be challenging. Um, so you can get away with kind of coming up with your own equipment per se. Yeah, I think you can even, at the very least, uh, if you had a tennis ball, or just make a fist and squeeze yeah. your fist super hard through the range of move. That's still that's going to be better than nothing. All right. Did you read the next one in your head before before trying to tackle this? Um. Yes. So recommendations for dosing slash programming slash progressing isometric holds. Okay. You know. I'm still interpreting it. Uh, so, I read well, so, it. Right? So come on, people. Isometric holds. Do you want progressions for, for planks or do you want progressions for planche and lever? Like, you, isometric oh, I was hold. thinking. I was thinking like middle split isometric holds. Uh, oh, so, see, yeah, you're, see, you're all uh, – I'm starting at planks. You know, we, we can give them plank progressions. I know you do it. You got to do some with your seven-year-old clients. Like, give us a little more to go off of here. Well, yeah. It's, it's a good question, but he left out the main part there. So – why don't you give your recommendations for what you thought it was and I'll give my recommendations for what I feel like answering after you've answered because okay, so it's good I'm, information I'm, we can give. Yeah, I'm taking it as a mobility technique. So okay, let's yeah. say maybe a horse stance, maybe a middle split isometric fold, something like that. Okay. So for dosing, programming, and progressing. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any isometric hold from a mobility standpoint when it comes to like a middle split or a horse stance that you mm -hmm. wouldn't hold for any less than 30 seconds. So at the bare minimum, let's just stick with middle split isometric holds because that's an easy example. At the bare minimum, you should be able to hit maybe five to six sets of at least 30 seconds before you're doing any sort of different variation. And the different variation would just be getting lower and lower. Um, eventually, I would add in like blocks and assist the, the shins, take some of the load off. Um, the adductor so you can get a little lower but I would own a certain position be able to not easily but be able to own a position for five to six sets of 30 seconds um, before you try to get any lower okay I like that so I'll, I'll think of this on like a, a push pull for isometrics for the planche and the uh, the lever I feel uh, like this must be what that question is directed towards because the middle split and like mobility examples seem so intuitive that <laughs> but go, the, go the, ahead. this round of questions or this list that we chose to open up they're they're like 75 percent the way there where they're like really good but they left out something so we can't really answer their specific questions so we're having to make it up on the spot <laughs> see this is another lesson we're learning though once we read it and recognize that just add in whatever you want the question yeah, to be exactly um, so yeah, if I was going to do it for something like planche and lever, um, I like how John bro brought up the minimum of 30 seconds. Um, I'd be on the opposite end of that. I know a lot of people, you know, um, I've seen programs where they, they have you do planche holds or lever holds for like 30 to 60 seconds. Um, I'm never doing more than, I rarely do for the, the main primary work, um, more than 10 seconds. You know, sometimes I'll go 12 to 15, but normally I keep the the tuck planche and the tuck lever at 10 seconds. Um, so if we're going to start off 10 second holds, I like five sets. You could alternate back and forth. So you're doing like a super set. Um, 
for planches, I would choose a variation that your hips aren't dropping down. So a lot of people have to start with a band around their ankle, around their waist, um, make it look pretty, make it look perfect. Um, reinforce good habits from the beginning. I can't tell you how many times I have to tell my clients they're training like an asshole and their planche looks more like some sort of like l sit variation because their hips are dropping so low. Um, their scapula retracting and they're not accomplishing the purpose of the movement. Um, so it's okay to regress a movement for something like that. Um, then looking at the tuck lever, same thing, 10 seconds, five sets. Um, most people, uh, I'm going to have them start off as balled up as possible into that tuck position so they can hold it and just get used to being in a horizontal position, feel what it feels like, um, you know, to push your hands into the rings. Um, if you can't do a tuck lever, I would do something like uh, put your feet on a bench, um, hands on a low pull-up bar or a barbell in a squat rack, and you retract your scapula and just hold there. Um, so like kind of like what you do before doing a ring row or a, a bar row or something, if you can visualize that, John. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. Um, yeah, so it's just like a spot. It's just working scap retraction right there yeah. um, because it's kind of hard to use a band for a tuck lever to get started. Um, so that's what I would do for those two based upon my interpretation of the question. Yeah, and I'll say as someone who definitely struggles with that type of strength stuff, I will say if you're questioning whether you should advance or not, you probably shouldn't. I yeah. think you'll probably know like when you're ready for the next, yeah, yeah. whatever the next uh, progression of a drill is. Yeah. Cause honestly, when you're progressing it too, you don't want to like, if you want to progress it, you don't want that next variation to be outside of your capability. You want to be able to jump into that next progression and train it right away. Like I hold a lot of my athletes back for a while. Like I, I don't have them test things often. Um, and when I do like, you know, if I've had someone doing eccentric handstand pushups for a while, I really hold them off on, you know, attempting singles um, but when I give them the go ahead to do singles, you know, they're at a capacity that's so high, they can go bust out, you know, the next time 10 singles, 15 singles right off the bat. And now we're training it, you know, so it's not you're testing it or trying it, you're training it. So I, I really like, um, I err on the side of doing a progression much longer than you probably want to, but then you can hop to the next one. Yeah. All, right. Um, all right. Powders, pills, supplements, yay or nay. We jumped to that list. Okay, well, I'm trying to find that list. You want to start? Um, so I don't take – the only – I guess anything that even falls into that realm that I take is I take a daily, like, electrolyte right in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, all natural ingredients, very minimal. I just feel – and Wes kind of got me onto that. I just feel – you can kind of feel yourself get hydrated quickly, and it's just a great way to start the day, I think. I'll take a protein shake every now and then, like once mm -hmm. in a blue moon, but it's more – it's not for performance or anything. It's more for as like a treat. Like I might have some nice raw goat milk and I'm like, oh, let's make this a chocolate. Let's make this chocolate milk as a treat. It's nothing to do with trying to recover from a workout or build muscle mass or anything like that. I think, uh, and I know Wes will agree, it's, most people's diets really, really suck. And I think if you can get your diet really spot on, like you're not going to need any of that stuff. Um, maybe if you're competing in like a bodybuilding show or something, but I don't know if that's quite our audience. Uh, but yeah, I just, I find my diet and my sleep, um, and some other recovery strategies do everything I really need. So definitely the electrolytes first thing in the morning, which one are you taking now for the electrolytes? I'm taking perfect ketos. It's very, very good and very affordable as well. Is it? I've been taking, so the element it's LMN. L M N T. I love that one too. I'm very super, tasty. super salty. Anthony got me onto those and they've got, they keep releasing flavors. Um, so I, I take I those, like the salt, especially, especially come the summer in the South for John and myself with the humidity outside and how much we sweat. Um, oh, yeah. so yeah, so I, I take that. Um, and then I'll do, um, because generally I'm doing two sessions a day. I'm doing strength training and then I'm doing jujitsu in the evening or vice versa. Um, after my first training session, I'll, I'll do a, a protein shake with unflavored goat whey in it. Um, and it's, it's more so just to, to be able to get quick carbs in because then when I'm going to a jujitsu session or going to my evening session, uh, I just can only eat so much food so quickly. Um, and then with, um, I struggle to maintain weight to begin with. I just, you know, I, I can eat an extraordinary amount of food and not put on weight. So the shake is just a way for me to, to get some quick calories in, especially carbs, um, in that to recover from that 
morning session before I go to the evening one. Um, but outside of that, no. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what protein powder do you take? If you don't mind me asking. So it's, um, naked nutrition. Okay. Um, and it's unflavored goat whey. And I think it's like grass fed goats too. I hope. Okay. Cause I, um, I do get asked quite a bit, like what's a good yeah. natural. And I honestly, I usually say perfect keto, but theirs isn't super, there's a fair amount of protein, but it's yeah. not like probably not no. nearly what you're taking. So and, that's Steph, good to know and Steph takes the, uh, the naked nutrition, um, like normal whey protein, um, for training for the CrossFit games right now. Cause she definitely needs that. Um, oh, cool. And she takes um, their vanilla flavored one. And sometimes I'll mix a little of their vanilla flavored into like some uh, Greek yogurt or something or bake oh, with it. Nice. And it, it, it's really good. It's really clean. Um, you know, um, I don't know. There's a there's really good argument for both sides on whether or not your protein needs to be grass fed or not. Um, I don't really give a shit. I'm just going to spend more and hope hope that we find out later on. We did at the, need at the very least the placebo. Think, yeah. think if you didn't have it, the placebo effect, you'd be like, oh, this isn't gonna work because it's not like honestly, I'm not saving yeah. that much money and I'd much rather just buy something that, that may be better quality. I don't know. Yeah. You're uh, supporting a better company at the end of the day. So. Yeah, and apparently like they advertise that they don't put like bleach or any other sort of like dyes and stuff in it. And I was like, what the fuck do they put in protein that they have to advertise this? But yeah, so it, it's a good I feel like nowadays so many nutritional companies just say like, <laughs> like something like that, like, no bleed that in, like makes you think like, oh my God, these other brands must have it. Like when in reality, none of them might have it, but it's just- uh, Nobody's ever put bleach in. It's just it's such an absurd statement. It's on the cover that you're just like, oh my God, okay, I need this. <laughs> I do. But yeah, naked nutrition, it's good. Um, I don't think it's that overpriced. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, this one segues very nicely into it. It looks like it was asked by the same person, so it makes sense. Recovery options that don't require ice bath slash sauna. Yeah. Um, so I kind of touched on one just there. I think sleep is so key, completely overlooked by everyone. Um, I can tell such a big difference if I don't get a good night's sleep, not just from working out or recovering, just from my ability to converse with people. I'm usually working with anywhere from like six to eight people during the day. And if I've gotten a kind of restless night's sleep or I was just off for some reason, like my cognitive ability is going to be diminished for sure. So, uh, and my workout in the morning is going to be sloppy too. Um, so sleep is absolutely number one. I, a big thing that I've been doing for probably the past year now is I try to stop looking at my phone at like 7.30 Ooh, yeah. and I keep it out of the bedroom. Like I set my alarm and set it outside of the door. And I usually, disclaimer, I usually go to bed between 8 and 8.30. So that's just before I'm going to bed. Um, <laughs> but it, help, it helps big time. And I usually just read till I fall asleep. And I, I, I usually get great sleep. So, um, And we keep it super dark and cool in our bedroom as well. I like that. Um, yeah, I definitely don't. I don't sleep with my phone in the room, but... Steph has hers on the other side of the bed. So I feel like it just defeats the purpose. I don't know. Um, so Caitlin, Caitlin has hers too. I try not to look at it. So <laughs> big one for me um, that I've really noticed a difference in is actually every day I'll do a, it's like a 45 to 60 minute walk. And we have a big loop that walks right around the, uh, like on the water where I live right now. Um, I won't bring a phone with me. So completely unplug, oh, you know, I bring the dog. Um, so that 45 to 60 minute walk a day, really, I feel like, um, you know, the parts that I can take off my shoes, I'll take off my shoes too. Um, it's very relaxing. You know, I have no distractions. You know, I don't have any. So the, one of my clients asked this question, so it's good. I, I don't have you guys bothering me, texting me because um, I don't have my phone. So it's, it's a very nice way to chill um, and kind of re refocus, I guess. The other one for me is actually jujitsu as well because it's it's a great i would call flow activity um so i would just try to find activities that you can do that are kind of kind of you're totally in, in, involved or engaged in it um you know i'm not thinking about anything else when someone's trying to choke me you know surfing's another really good one um the tra this type of training we do it can and cannot be it depends on the day and how you're feeling and what, what you have going on yeah and don't be scared to take a rest day too if you uh feel like you're not recovering well you could just be going too hard and uh, i know Wes and i talk about this all the time but because this training is fun yeah 
and you're like and then i always think oh i'm taking a rest day well i'm not going to progress like i'm going to like regress somehow um they're, they're they're truly valuable so do some of the stuff wes said go on that long walk instead of instead of during your session go out to the beach and just kick it um go try a new sport like jujitsu something like that it can help it can help big time um and we kind of mentioned it with the powders and supplements. Uh, if your tr- nutrition sucks, your recovery is going to suck. So yeah, maybe take a, take a look at what your nutrition looks like. Stop eating processed foods. Try to lower the sugar intake. Don't eat the shitty oils. Um, I feel like at this point, people should kind of know what decent nutrition looks like. So I'd hope so. Yeah. All right. What do you want to jump to here? Um, if you have one, I'm going to pull up the other. Do you have one? I put up an, another um, another one that starts with here. I'll, I'm I'm going to make the mistake again of reading it before. I'm going to read it out loud. What okay. vir- what virtues are you signaling uh, by working on body weight movements, feats of strength? So at least it was a a complete question. I, I'll give him that. <laughs> well, I'm I'm now going to have to go look up the definition of virtues though. So this is going <laughs> to take a little while. That's fair. Um, honestly, at, at the end of the day we just enjoy it. It's fun. You know, is is it, um, you know, I'm not trying to like, like we can, I can come up with, with a great argument and I've done posts on this in the past on why, you know, the handstand pushup could be better than a military press or, you know, working on the splits is going to be better than, you know, pursuing a double body weight back squat. But at the end of the day, like, you know, people that, um, that are probably listening to this podcast and, um, enjoying these things like you guys are all kind of a bunch of assholes like you're working on one arm chin-ups you know splits going all the way to the floor you know freestanding handstand push-ups like the woman i talked about on the podcast last time that we've gone from four minutes of walking with no lower back pain to 45 minutes her life has changed from that you guys you guys are just really selfish and you want to do cool things so really just whatever seems cool to you that you want to pursue and you're interested in go for it like that that's why john and i i think pursue the things we we, we, we're excited about them. We find them interesting. Um, you know, our lives aren't going to be better if, you know, you can do a, a middle split balls to the floor or, you know, I'm getting my balls to the top of an iPhone at this point in time. You know, that's not going to improve the quality of our life. Um, we just enjoy the challenge. We enjoy pursuing it. Um, I'm speaking for John here, so I'm just going to say I, pers- I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy pursuing it. It's I enjoy fun. it too. Yeah, I find it. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate that. You know, I just find it, uh, it it's just kind of, um, it reminds me a lot of growing up skateboarding and snowboarding. It's this tinkering thing like, oh, that handstand push up. You know, I got it, but it, it, I, I think I can make it better. And if, how do I make it better? Okay, maybe I need to improve, you know, my external rotation or my scapular projection. Let me go work on that, then I'll come back to it. Um, so there's all these pieces or components. And yes, there, there's that with a deadlift and a squat too, don't get me wrong, or Olympic lifting. It's just what John and I like doing. Yeah. I mean, I think it is a very, you could say holistic practice. Like it's the way Wes was just describing, like kind of figuring out the puzzle pieces. It makes you so much more aware of where your body is in space, building this body awareness. It's going to, that's a very uh, longevity practice. Like this is going to help us out so much better as we get a little older than just going to the gym and kind of slinging weight around. Um, And I kind of got into this style of practice because I recognized my body moved like shit. And my goal became, I need to make my body move better. And I think that's a goal everyone should probably have. And that's still kind of my underlying goal of the practice. It's okay. My body moves at this level now. How do I make it move better? Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the, probably the longest sort of physical practice I've stuck with. And I don't plan on ever. It's just always something cool to do and cool to learn. So it's definitely like an easy to get motivated thing to do. So no like spiritual reason but it's just yeah. cool did you ever look up what virtue means i figured as you started talking about it i kind of <laughs> had an idea and then i was like oh like what it's kind of like what's the spiritual reasoning for this sort of practice <laughs> all right so we got another one here injury rehab west big on some pain is okay in process why all right you know i think you touched on that a little bit with the uh the yeah. complicated this question earlier yeah you know um I think everyone at this point in time is so hyper-focused on every little detail and there's so much information out there that people just at the, the slightest little bit of discomfort, oh my God, what was that like, What was that in my elbow? Am I developing some sort of tennis elbow or golfer's elbow? Yeah. Or, oh shit, I have impingement. 
Um, and then what do we do? We, we, we have all this information at our fingertips so we can look into it. Um, and then it's like, Oh God, you know, do I have tennis elbow? Do I have cancer? Um, you know, and then you go to a healthcare provider and they've probably made it worse because you could, most healthcare providers, you know, you're not going to go to some, someone and have them tell you, Oh, you're fine. You'll be good in, in a couple of days. Um, or that's a shitty healthcare. I don't want to say shitty healthcare provider. Um, you know, but if you go to someone Tradition, and, traditional, like a traditional yeah, healthcare yeah, provider, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. a normal, yeah. And, and you know, for some sort of elbow discomfort, let's say, or shoulder discomfort, what are they going to do? They're going to tell you to come three times a week for the next eight weeks and almost create a problem because they need to give you some sort, or they feel the desire most of the time to give you some sort of diagnosis. So it's, you know, this muscle is weak because this one is overactive here, or this thing is tight or what, whatever elaborate reason they come up with to sound really smart, they're going to give it to you. That person's going to buy into it and create that problem. Like I, it's much better. Just give it a couple of days rest. You know, um, I think a lot, a lot of problems could be solved. <laughs> it sounds really bad by not going and seeing someone at first because then they create a problem in your head that probably didn't need to be there in the first place. Yeah. Your um, slight scoliosis. Yeah, exactly. One well, leg is a quarter of a centimeter shorter than the other or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'll get clients texting me be like, Hey, like when I move my shoulder like this, it's really uncomfortable. And like, first of all, how the fuck did you figure out? Like, do you just like the movements? It's not something natural. These are very elaborate movements. I'll get like questions or people will send me videos of and a lot of the times they'll actually look like submissions that we do in jujitsu where like we're, we're moving the shoulder in like a position that's like not a, a good position to be in. So it's like, no shit, it hurts. Stop moving in that direction. And I think I've posted this in my story before, you know, if I punch myself in the crotch, it's going to hurt. So I'm going to stop punching myself in the crotch. Um, <laughs> but people are just, you know, it's, we're, we're just so hyper sensitive to, to pain and, um, we don't need to be. I think if anyone was going to do any research or read into it more, I'd check out Greg Lehman's stuff on it um, because we may just be, you know, to a lesser extent. I don't want to say, you know, he said it before on a podcast, prone to pain. You know, I don't think the illusion that you're going to be completely pain free. Maybe there's going to be some, um, I think people make up our um, confused discomfort for pain a lot of the times. Um, I think we're going to be in a decent amount of discomfort if we're pushing our body's limits. Um, you know, in the slightest bit of discomfort, I think people mistake for pain more often than not. That was a good mic drop. I think we should end on that one. Hey, that, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that, that works for me. You need to go to bed soon. Not, it's Friday night. I'll stay up a little later. The okay. NFL draft will be on until like midnight, so I might have to watch that for like an hour. Okay. You're oh, this is a good. Here. This would be a good question. The first round of the NFL draft was yesterday. Do you know who the number one pick was? You're asking me. Yeah. No, not a clue. Wow. Okay. <laughs> not a sports fan. Okay. You know, I could have I could have Googled it really quickly because I have my phone right here, so I should have like stalled and Googled it really quickly so I could. Well, answer that'll, it. that'll be a good good comic belief for our sports fans out there. That's good. I can bring some. Uh, I can get somebody to get some laughs at me. That's fine. Um, what, what do we end it on, on people, uh, writing reviews? What do we want to say? Yeah, if you can obviously write a review that helps, uh, promote the podcast. If you like the podcast, share it in your Instagram stories, stuff like that. Um, yeah, keep listening and, uh, let us know if you guys have any topics or guests you want us to interview possibly, uh, feel free to slide into the DMS and, uh, and let us know. We'd love to get some ideas for content, whether it's just Wes and I, or possibly a guest as well. So any feedback like that's always awesome. Yeah, this is like the fifth time tonight. I'm just going to be like what John said. Yeah. Perfect. And we're out.